Alright, good night, boys. Good night, everybody. Good night, boys and girls. Alright, my name is Keisha Stone Smith, and you can call me Auntie Keisha. Alright, tonight we'll be looking at communion equals community. But before we we will be focusing too on communion, bread and wine. But I'd like to ask you, do you know what the word communion means? Anybody want to tell me if they know what the word communion means? To come together to worship God. Beautiful. All right, have you ever been at a communion service before? Yes. Okay, can you tell me what are some of the things that takes place at a communion service? Prayer, the drinking of wine, Okay, very good. Smart boys and girls. Okay, as you said, the word communion means together as one. And in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 to 29, it speaks exactly about the same bread and wine that you talk about. Communion. All right. The day when, the day, the same day that Jesus was going to be betrayed, Jesus knew it was the very last day when he would be with his friends, his disciples. So, are you listening? So you know, while his disciples, while they had gathered to eat, Jesus knew it would have been the very last supper that they were going to have. But the disciples were so distracted, they didn't realize what was happening. So they were arguing. So what Jesus did, because they were arguing, they forgot. Their custom then was to, when they gathered to eat, they would hire somebody to wash their feet. But they had forgotten all about that. Why do you think they would gather somebody to wash, hire somebody to wash their feet? Anybody? Because they wanted to feel like they were very special. Well, let us see. They would hire somebody to wash their feet because back then in the Middle East, remember, Back in those days, they didn't have beautiful roads like what we have today. They didn't have motor car or anything like that. They didn't have that. So they would have to walk long journeys on dusty roads. And because the road was dusty, their feet would become what? Very, very dirty. And as a result of that, you know what they had to do? When they gathered to eat in order for them to feel clean, they had to wash their feet. Very good. So while they were there arguing and all of that, Jesus wanted to get their attention. So he got up, stooped down on his knees with his basin and water, and he started washing their feet. You know, that was strange, because normally they would have hired somebody, but their master was washing their feet. So this is a picture of Jesus on his knees washing their feet. And when Jesus was washing their feet, guess what? He was only washing away the dirt from their feet. He wanted to wash away all their sins. What are some of the sins you think we commit each day? Lying. What else? Stealing. Yes, stealing. So these were some of the things that Jesus wanted to wash away. And remember, we said communion means what? Togetherness. Right, togetherness. It means together as one. And Jesus wanted them to? Stop arguing. He wanted them to be as one, loving each other, looking out for each other, and all of that. So Jesus washed their feet. Then, when they, they were, their feet was, was washed and they were very clean now. And they think that, okay, maybe God, Jesus has washed away all the bad thoughts and arguing. And they were now in the mode of togetherness. Guess what Jesus did? He wanted to do something else for them to remember him. What do you think was that something that Jesus wanted to do? Anybody? All right. Jesus got up while they were eating. He took bread and he broke a piece and gave it to each of them and said, this would remind you of my body. The breaking of bread would remind them of his, of his body. And he gave them 
wine to drink. What did Jesus give them to drink? And the wine would represent his spilled blood. The wine would represent his what? His spilled blood. And this was something that was very special to Jesus, you know. These disciples didn't realize what was happening, but Jesus knew. And he did this for them to remember him. So he said that we must, as often as we can, we are to do it because it is an example for us to follow. So as often as we, we should, we should do what? Wash each other's feet. And, we, and this is showing humility. We love our... Can you imagine? You go down on your knees and you're washing somebody's feet. It means that you care about them, don't it? Yes, and this is what Jesus wants us to do, to care about each other. All right. And he said that when we drink the wine, it represents his what? Blood. Blood is spilled blood. And the breaking of the bread represents his what? Body. His body. Very good. And remember, this is a picture of Jesus on the cross when he was crucified. So the whole communion service represents what? His death. It represents his death and resurrection. It represents togetherness. It represents what? All of us coming together as one family, living, loving, and happy. So it represents togetherness. And it also represents, it represents unity, togetherness, which is togetherness. The resurrection and it is and it also represents the coming of God. So guess what? When we eat and drink and celebrate, we are doing this until He comes back for us. So isn't that uh, something wonderful? Yes, and we should not just get up and take the communion service like that, you know. We have to think about it, think about the things that we have done, think about who we have wrong. We have to first, yes, we need to be. Baptized. We need to be what? And for us to be baptized, we have to recognize that what the, our lives that we are living is not pleasing to God. And then we have to ask God to do what? To forgive us. Right? And then we give our hearts to him to show him that, yes, we really, really want to serve him. And we do so through baptism. So when we are taking the communion service, we are not to just take it like that. We are to think about it, think about what we have wronged. And if we, we have done something wrong to somebody, we go to them and say, you know, I have done wrong to you, or I have to tell a lie, or I have taken something that is not mine, and I am sorry. And you can wash foot with that person too. But when you are baptized, that's the time we do what? We participate in the communion service. All right, boys and girls, did you learn anything? What does communion mean? Who wants to tell me what? Togetherness and unity. Very good. Anybody want to tell me what are some of the things that takes place in the communion again? Prayer. All right, the breaking of bread. Anybody want to tell me what does it mean? The bread means Jesus' body and the wine means his spirit blood. Yes, very good. At this time, we are going to ask the children to stand. We are going to pray. And we are going to ask for groups of three. One group here, one in the middle, and one over the other side. And just pray that the Lord helps the children to understand his words that they may be embedded within their hearts and soon they'll be able to apply it to their lives.
Good evening, everyone. This evening, it's such a pleasure to see so many of us out. And the Forbearance Band is on duty this afternoon. At this time, Sister Elaine Clark will tell us the opening song. The opening song is 618. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. 618. Stand up, stand up. Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, and we will read verse 24 to 29. We will read alternately. We're there. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. <clears throat> For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, 
he do show the Lord's death until he comes. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup together. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Here endeth the reading of God's holy word. Reverend Janine, as we pray. Kind, loving, compassionate Father, with grateful hearts we bow before you this evening, giving thee thanks for spared lives that we could be in your court once more to worship and adore your holy name. Where we have sinned and come short, we ask your forgiveness and in filling of your Holy Spirit, so that as we worship this evening, our worship will be accepted and the blessing and the strength we come seek and receive it. We have been blessed over these nights that is past and gone. Tonight is no exception. Give us a message from whosoever will bring it to us tonight, a message that will come straight from your throne, which will help us all to be closer drawn to thee, and when we have left, leave here this evening, may we all be blessed and be closer drawn to you, we pray in Jesus' name. As a church, we are blessed in double portion tonight, in that we will have two speakers instead of one. Now, if I should begin to tell you some of the discussions we have had, I would have to go through all these pages, and I would not be finished. But I will not do that tonight. Now, when I first met these two individuals, I quickly learned one thing about them. One was outspoken, and the other one was very shy. But this puzzled me because the one that is shy stands in front of a classroom each day as that one's profession. So I couldn't understand why that person was shy. Now, the many discussions that we have had over the years that I have known them, we have spoken about the topics in the quarterlies, we have discussed church history, scriptures on a whole, and just simple everyday topics. And these discussions sometimes stem from minutes into hours and they are always enjoyable. These two individuals are husband and wife, and they have been joined together happily for over five years. Another thing that I admire about these two individuals is the fact that they are both fighters. Now, fighters in the sense that if one is falling back in their spiritual walk, the other is always there to encourage. These two individuals love the Lord, and together their aim is to please God at all times and to make it into the kingdom. Tonight, I speak of no other than Brother Ricardo and Sister Erica Lee. Although most of us will know that New Haven is Erica's church, but Ricardo has now shown us that us as New Haven members 
have made him so comfortable that he is also a part of us. One of their commitments in their spiritual walk for 2017 is to do more for the Lord this year. And of course, this includes what they will do this evening. Now, as they speak to us, let me, all, uh, let me ask you all to do for them what they have asked me to do. Say a prayer that God will use them to deliver the message he has for all of us tonight. Before they come, Sister Monique Samuels will bless our heart with her song. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. There will be mountains that I do have to climb, and there will be battles that I do have to fight. But victory or defeat is up to me to decide. But how can I expect to win? If I never tried, I just can't give up now. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy and I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Never said there wouldn't be trials. Never said I would fall. Never said that everything will go the way I want to go. But when my back is against the wall and I feel like hope is gone, I just lift my head up to the sky and say, help me to be strong. No, I just can't give up now. I come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that the road would be easy And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me I know you did bring me I will even leave me lonely Even when I can't see clearly I know that you are with me so I can I just can't give up now I come too far from where I started from Nobody told me that the road would be easy And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me Good evening, church. Thank you, Lord, for another day. There, the dinner is ready.
masuk dulu so. Jangan sit kan search kan sit dulu How was your day? Uh, it was a bit rough. Really? Yeah, we have days like that sometimes. Have you ever felt alone, abandoned, and broken-hearted? Yes, I have. Well, this week is communion at church, and to be honest, this is how Martin Luther felt. He felt like God was being too hard on him. He felt like he could not keep God's, God's commandment, regardless of how hard he tried. The more he tried, the more he failed, and he felt as if he was doomed to stay in sin. He was afraid, terribly afraid. What do you mean, man? Well, in the medieval church, many people were afraid of God, afraid of death and afraid that God had abandoned them. The church capitalized on these fears as a way of making funds. The church gave its members opportunity to pay for their sins. People could purchase indulgences. So, you mean that if I want to commit a sin tomorrow, I could pay for that sin from today? Yes. Yes. That sounds presumptuous to me. Yes. In those days, the church allowed people to pay for their pardons. For example, if they had a few religious men in the church, men who were designated to be righteous because of their perceived good work, it would fall into a treasury and the members would go into the treasury and buy some indulgence. Better yet, they would buy some sympathy or pardon. These indulgences were in their eyes essentially reminiscences of sin. Wow. Wow. Yes. So, so what did he do? Well, they had, first of all, they had to pay for the forgiveness of their sins and the people were prepared to pay a pretty penny out of fear. Wow. That sounds serious. Mm -hmm. hmm. Darling. Yes. I didn't hear what you said. Can you go again for me, please? The people had to pay for the forgiveness of their sins. And they wanted to pay. They, regardless of how much it cost, they were willing to pay for it. Wow. Boy, that's so serious, man. Yes. Yes. I have to give God thanks that he came and he gave us an opportunity that we don't have to be bound by these kinds of things. No, no. But guess what, dear? Martin Luther was upset about this. He was irate. As a matter of fact, most of the 95 theses that he nailed on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, criticize the practices of collecting indulgences for sins. So, so, so tell me, so, so what did he do? Well, exactly, listen. In place of indulgences, Dr. Martin Luther put in place the Lord's Supper, and we are having it for dinner tonight. He implemented the Lord's Supper in the biblical example. Wow. So I see. So that's why we have been wine and, and bread. Yes. But it's only one slice of bread. Yes, I darling. Mean, that, that can't share for Yes, me, dear. You. We have to share. My God. So we have darling, to share. You, wow. Well, all 
Alright, if, if that is what has been provided, then we might as well enjoy it. But I'll toast it for you, dear. And maybe we can put some, sup, some butter on it. And then when we go to church, we have the real thing. Okay. But however, over the centuries, the Lord's Supper had become an instrument of power for the church. Only the clergy were entitled to receive the bread and wine. Can you believe that? Wow, well, that doesn't sound right. Yes, yes, the Lord's Supper symbolized the suffering and the death of Jesus. But the ordinary people, the people like you and me, yes, the common people, the lay people, they were not allowed to receive the wine in the Lord's Supper. They justified this by saying that these lay people might spill the precious blood of Jesus. How ironic, isn't it? as if the priests couldn't spill it themselves, right? Anyway, listen. They felt that the congregation was not worth the risk. They just did not want to give them the precious blood. And there, and there was a wall. They had a wall called the choir screen that separated the congregation and the clergy during the supper. And to be honest, the painting in this year's Global Youth Week of Prayer illustrates just how Martin Luther felt about the Lord's Supper and what it represents. You can just take a look at the TV screen behind you, honey. Jesus is seen dressed as simple as the disciples not in those costly, luxurious robes worn by the clergy. The Passover lamb, as you can see right in the middle there, the Passover lamb is in the middle of the table. Here, this highlights the moment where Christ told the disciples that one of them would betray him. He was questioned who it would be, and he replied by saying, the one I will give bread to. He then gave the bread to Judas. Notwithstanding, the disciples were still uncertain. However, in the midst of the uncertainty, a young man is seen reaching for a cup of wine, then handing it to Luther. This is the painter in the picture. And to be honest, most of them did not understand what was happening as at this supper because everything back then was celebrated in Latin. The Latin words used to consecrate the communion bread was hoc es corpus meum. What? <laughs> this phrase means in English, this is my body. Whoa, so, so what eventually happened? Well... This language was translated in other languages as hocus pocus, meaning it's not understandable or comprehensible. All this had to end. Oh, sounds like serious business. Yes. And you know who ended it? The reformer, Jan Hus previously introduced the celebration of the Lord's Supper by including both the bread and wine in keeping with the biblical example. This service was joined now with the communion service being celebrated in German, the language that the people could understand. The congregation was no longer spectators. They could now actively take part in the communion service. The lay people, that's you and that's me, the lay people now found themselves sitting at the communion table on the Reformation altar. Wow, but honey, I didn't know you, you knew so much about the communion. Yes, the dear. Supper, the bread and the wine. Yes, dear. Wow, you have taught me a lot. Yes, dear. And guess what? Today, the most beautiful thing 
today the Lord's Supper is about me personally. It's about you personally. Are we that close to Jesus? Well, honey, as you have said that, um, I feel so touched. I, I can't eat even this bread and this wine right now because it reminds me too much of the sacrifice that Christ made yes. on Calvary's cross. Yes. And I, I would not want to partake of something like that right now in such a common way. Yes. So let us pray then. At this time, we'll pause for the first season of prayer. Each member will pray individually, thanking God for his sacrifice on Calvary's cross. Let us pray. Please kneel. Amen. Good evening, church. Are you feeling blessed and highly favored? God has been good to us. And many times we take his goodness for granted when we ought not to. And Christ gave, Christ paid a special price for us when he died on Calvary's cross. He could have said no. He could have said, my father, I cannot bear this. But because of his love, he died for us. And we ought not to take that for granted. As I come before you, Father, I recognize my limitations. For Lord, I have not the wherewithal to speak to your people. But God, as I have availed myself to your service, I pray, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. Confound not my tongue, O oh God. But may your words go forth with clarity. And at the end of the day, O oh God, I pray 
that every single member here today will, in a special way, recognize the price that you paid and will also realize that the communion service is something that is sacred, not to be taken lightly. Do, O God, for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. For Christ's sake, I pray. Amen. What we are today as a Bible-believing institution is the result of sacrifice, blood, sweat, tears, and even humiliation of many of our reformers. Men who would not allow their consciences to be stifled. How many of you can recall the emotions experienced when you received your first gift as a child? A toy, an article of clothing, something of significance. Solved your first problem or stared love in the eye for the first time. An overwhelming feeling of joy. Well, Martin Luther, well, Martin Luther's pioneering discovery of the good news of the gospel and the concept of justification by faith ignited significant joy within the chambers of his heart. And like bullet chambered within a weapon, he was ready to take this good news to the world. He even thought that perhaps he might have been able to convince the Jews that Jesus is in, indeed the Messiah. So he had a mountaintop experience. Protestant churches were being born, championing biblical truth. And so things were going pretty well. And like many of us, we would have had our mountaintop experiences. Things going well at work, things going well with the family, things going well, going well, going well, going well. But when things are going well in our lives, that is when we are most vulnerable because we tend to take things for granted. I'm not saying that Martin Luther did this, but for our own benefit, we ought to be careful. Well, as you know, the devil is always working. He's always planning. He's always trying to stop God's plans from going forth. And so what happened after was that the Pope and the Emperor of Rome wanted to take action against Luther for heresy. But God always provides a way out. Isaiah 65, 24 says that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And so God provided a way of escape. Prince Frederick the Wise provided that refuge. And because of his influence, he was able to keep the Pope and his militants and his forces at bay. Martin Luther's adversaries had to step back, at least for the time being, because God works on time and in time. This allowed 
Luther to assert his belief that the communion service should only be carried out as instructed by Christ in the Holy Scriptures. And as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, this is something we can identify with. Because as Bible-believing Christians, we know what it is like to stand up for thus, said the Lord. This resulted in the celebration of the Lord's Supper by regular members of the church in both bread and wine. For Martin Luther, the communion service represented fellowship with Christ and closeness that is available to all believers. As Seventh-day Adventists, what does the Lord's Supper mean to us? I'm sure it has significant meaning. For many of us, it may mean one thing. For others of us, it may mean something else. Because we have to be real with the fact that not all of us would have taken some time to internalize what the communion service really means. For some of us, it's a day when the service is held for a prolonged period. For some of us, it may be a period when we are forced to engage in a humility exercise that we may not enjoy. But what should it really mean to us? As Seventh-day Adventists, we believe that the Lord's Supper is a memorial and the bread and wine are symbols of the broken and spilled blood of Jesus. Did you know that there are others who believe that the wine and the bread are the literal blood and body of Christ? There are those who believe in transub transubstantiation, which refers to the wine and the bread going through a process as of transformation where it becomes the literal blood of Christ and his literal body. If that were to be the case, what would we be preaching? Cannibalism? Certainly not. All church members should participate in this sacred communion because through the Holy Spirit, Christ meets his people and energizes them by his presence. According to Ellen G. White, in Desires of Ages, page 656, we need not be concerned about the spiritual conditions of those administering the ordinances. As Christ is present to minister to his children, for if we fix our eyes upon Jesus, we will receive a special blessing. So when we come to communion service, it's not about us. It's not about how we look, what we have to offer, the offering that we are able to give, but it's about Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Luke 21, 9 to 20, calls us to a remembrance of Christ who forms the focal point of this occasion. As we prayerfully partake of these emblems, an extraordinary closeness is created with our Savior. This moment 
should not be a sorrowful one. For the same Jesus who went up shall again return through the eastern skies. The foot washing service that proceeds allows for self-examination, confession of sins, reconciliation, reconciliation of differences, and forgiveness. The assurance of being cleansed by the blood of the Savior and to commune with him. The Lord's Supper replaces the Passover festival of the Old Covenant era. Exodus 12, verse 27. God commands us to observe this ordinance for generations to come. But if we recall, when Christ was to be crucified, during that period, the Jews were celebrating the Passover. And for the purpose of not being ceremonially defiled, the high priest handed over Jesus. The Lord's Supper should not be avoided. It reconnects us with the source of grace. And that grace is not found within us. That grace comes from God. And the celebration of the communion service is a memorial of that grace. For where would we have been without this grace? Condemned to a life of sin and death until Christ came and paid that ultimate price. What a sacrifice. In a world of turmoil, conflict, and divide. At the communion table, we are united with Christ and each other. 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17, the New International Version reads, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. And so when we come into God's house on communion day, it's about unifying in one spirit, it's about being in one accord. It's about giving God the highest praise. If we really understand what it is that Christ did for us, we cannot take this lightly. And I must say, I have taken it lightly before. Because unless we truly internalize the sacrifice, then we will just pass over it. At this time, we will have the second season of prayer. And this will be a group prayer. I'm asking that we come together in group of threes. And we will pray for unity and humility among the brethren. And this prayer will be for three minutes. Then the person designated for this prayer will close this session of prayer.
for the all kneel for prayer. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, how to pray, because we know not all, how we ought to pray. Dear kind, compassionate Father, I want to thank you, dear Lord, for bringing us into your course once more, where we can listen to your words coming to us from this, your daughter and your son. Thank you for this week of prayer, dear Lord. This is important to us because this is on the only way we can communicate with you, dear Lord. As prayer does not bring you down to us, but bring us up to you. Dear Father, as we have been focusing tonight on unity, I pray, dear Lord, that you will humble us before you, dear Lord. You, t you taught us the perfect example as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit uniting in one in purpose, dear Lord, for, for this work, dear Lord and for us to know what it is to be humble. Dear Lord, I pray that you unite us, dear Father. On the day of Pentecost, it was only when the disciples put away their differences that they received the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They had, they had differences, dear Lord. They were fighting and bickering who should be first and who should be last. But you taught them, dear Lord, that it's only when they come together, putting away all their differences, dear Lord, then you can do a mighty work through them. And so tonight we come, dear Lord, in no different way, dear Lord. You said in, in your words that if we have heart against our, our brothers and sisters, we should leave our gifts at the altar and go and make it right. I pray, dear Father, that whatever we know that it is not a very easy thing to do, Lord, but I pray that you will humble us, dear Father, so that we can do, it, do what is right in your sight, dear Father. Help us as a family, as brothers and sisters, to live in love and in unity, dear God. Have mercy upon us, dear Jesus. Help us that we are malice and backbiting and all the many sins that we have cherished, dear Lord. I pray, dear Lord, that we put, that you put, we put them aside Dear Lord, and we come humbly before you, dear God. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Help us, dear, dear Father, that at the end of this week of prayer, dear Lord, our lives will be transformed. We'll never be the same again, dear Father. We'll be, we will be baptized anew, dear Lord. We'll have a new experience with you. And the next communion service that we gather here, dear Lord, we will take a, we'll have a different look, a new outlook, dear Lord. Help us as we come, dear Father. We know that we are not worthy. We are so unworthy, dear Lord. It is only in your blood. It is only you who are worthy, dear Jesus. And so I pray that you'll take away our filthy garments and give us a, a heart, uh, your garment, dear Father. Take away all the malice, everything that, that will, uh, will cause us to lose our way, dear Father. And I pray, dear Jesus, that when time and urge shall be ended, dear Father. All of us here will have a part in your kingdom and we'll be able to sit at your feet, worshiping and giving you thanks, dear Lord, for all that you have done, for the sacrifice that you have made, dear Lord, on Calvary, for our sins. We'll be able, dear Lord, to say, this is our God we have waited for and he has saved us. Thank you for hearing, Lord. Thank you for answering. In your name I pray, amen and amen. During the sacred ordinances, believers renew their pledge of loyalty to their Lord and are refreshed by the unifying act, act of Jesus that joins us to God, even in our humanity. We lose our pride in the humility of Christ as we embark on the foot washing practice, a gesture that signifies cleansing, as well as a willingness to serve each other in love. Let us make a commitment to celebrate Jesus' death by being true disciples. For a gesture 
That signifies cleansing. Sorry. Let us, let us make a commitment to celebrate Jesus' death by being true disciples. For if we are faithful, we will receive the things that he has in waiting for us. For I had not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the hearts of man the things which God had prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. It is my hope, it is my prayer, that as we prepare ourselves for the next communion service, which I believe is next month, that we will prepare our hearts, we will take a new approach, and we will experience Christ afresh. We'll recognize that this sacrifice, such an awesome sacrifice, should not be taken lightly. May we come together in unity. May we unite in hearts and in spirit. If it is that it is our sincere desire to make it into heaven. May the Lord bless us. And may the Lord keep us. And may his light shine upon us. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrow like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Father in heaven, we are very grateful to you this evening, Lord, for what you have done for us. We are happy to know that you are interested in our salvation. We thank you for the plan of redemption. We thank you, God, that you have seen it fit to come and save sinners like us. This evening, help us as we go that not one word that has been spoken here will go through one year and come through the other, but that it will find lodgment in our hearts. And so as we go, that we will begin to prepare ourselves for the next Holy Communion service. I pray, Lord, that you'll help us to surrender our lives to you and to eradicate sins of every kind out of our lives. We pray, Lord, that you'll help us to put away the sin that easily beset us and that we will look to Calvary. We will sit at your feet and we will listen to the story over and over again. Oh God, thanks. For this great sacrifice and help us Lord that we will be grateful children as we continue to follow in your footsteps and to do what you have commanded us to do is my prayer in Jesus name. All right. All right.
Our closing hymn is 623. I will follow the, the first and the last verse on it. Six 